Thank you for attending. My name is Simone Williams. I'm with the BBB serving Metro Atlanta, Athens, and Northeast Georgia. We are so excited to, to be a Grow with Google partner and have Fatia Abdur Raza, and I have it. You got I'm it. <laughs> you got it. You got it. Keep going. <laughs> presenting this afternoon. I want to mention a couple of housekeeping items. You will be mute throughout the presentation. However, please feel free to communicate to use the chat and there will be a time for questions at the end. Also, BBB is hosting, a, is hosting our Students of Integrity Scholarship Program again this spring. This scholarship program recognizes graduating seniors high school seniors who display outstanding ethics and integrity and awards a minimum of $2,500 per winner. The student may be attending either a college or technical school this fall. We have dropped the link in the chat box for your for further information. We encourage you to please share this information to parents and students you may know. Finally, please look out for a survey email that will be sent following our webinar. BBB will be hosting more Grow with Google events throughout the year, and we want to be sure we provide you with content that you need. Without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce Patia. Patia? Yes, thank you, Simone. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this evening's session called Reach Customers Online with Google. Like Simone said, my name is Patia Abdul Razak, and I will be your Grow with Google presenter for this session and hopefully for all upcoming sessions. I would like to start off by saying a special thank you to the Better Business Bureau of Metro Atlanta, Athens, and Northeast Georgia for hosting today's webinar. In case you're unfamiliar with the Grow with Google program, Grow with Google helps people across the United States to grow their skills, careers, and businesses by offering free tools, training, and events. You can find out more about the program and all of the great resources available by going to google.com slash grow. During today's presentation, I'll introduce many of Google's products that can help your business to grow and succeed. A little bit more about me, and some people like to take a snapshot of this slide in case you have questions after. In addition to being a part of the Grow with Google speaker team, I also own a boutique digital marketing firm in New York City. And I usually work primarily with Google partners in Ohio and New York City. And occasionally, I get some exceptions like today. I'm really happy to be with you guys. You will be receiving a hard copy of today's presentation, and should you have any questions once you receive that hard copy, please don't hesitate to send me an email at this email address. You can also feel free to follow me on social media, and my handle is at Stylista Group, and I am constantly sharing small business digital marketing tips. So again, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Stylista Group, and you will be able to find me there. All right. We're going to break today's webinar into three sections. I'll start by explaining how Google search works and where different types of information can appear on the search results. By understanding how Google's algorithms select the websites and other information that surface on the search result pages, you can implement as a business owner strategies that can improve your website's chances of showing up in potential customer searches. In the second section, we will review Google My Business, a free tool on Google that can help your business appear across Google search and maps. And lastly, I'll show you how you can promote your products and services by creating a smart campaign using Google Ads. So let's get started. Let's reflect about how Google can possibly help businesses reach their current and future customers. Think about the sheer volume of searches happening online every single day. The number is in the billions, and each search is an opportunity for a business to connect to people who are looking for information. One of the main things that the research data shows is that a lot of people are searching for information about local businesses and looking for information such as hours of operation and driving directions. 
To get things started, I'm going to share a short video with me and I'd like you to reflect on it and think about if you can relate to anything in the video. As the video plays, you'll see examples of experiences that people have every day all around the world. Think about those examples and if you can relate to them or if you've ever had any of these what are called micro moments. All right, so let me get the video up and running. Just give me a second. person, I'd ask for a show of hands to see if any of you could relate to any of those situations, maybe not the exact situations, but having a moment in time where you were in a jam or you needed to find some information and then you just turned to Google to get an answer. I'll take an educated guess and say that almost all of us have had that situation and we were able to find exactly what we were looking for by doing a Google search. And that's true for people all around the world. We no longer go online, we live online. Every single day, we turn to whatever device is on hand to act on our needs. Now think about this as it relates to your potential customers. What are there I want to know, I want to go, I want to do, or I want to buy moments in relation to your business? Think about the questions people ask when they call your business or if you had a brick and mortar stop, they stop by your shop. Those are their I want to go, no, do, and buy moments. Rather than focusing on what you want people to know about your products and services, think about what they need, the questions that they ask you. What do they want to know about your business or your product or service? By doing that, you can leverage micro moments by using them as opportunities to build relationships with people who find your business online. If any of you have made a large purchase within the last year, such as a car, maybe television, or even smartphone, I want you to reflect on the decision-making process. How many of you started by visiting a store and talking directly to a clerk? Or how many of you started by researching online? I'm willing to bet that most of us start this research process online. And that's most people these days. And it's for all types of purchases, not just the big ones. And if you did some online shopping research, you might have started by reading customer reviews. Maybe you also did some price shopping or compared shipping costs or warranties. The takeaway here is that consumers often have a lot of information about products and services before they contact your business or visit your store. Taking all of this into consideration, your website has become your new front door. It is the first potential interaction that a customer has with your business. 
It's important to note that customers may start the shopping journey online, but there's still a lot happening offline. In fact, 85% of all transactions still happen in local stores. Also, the research shows that people are more concerned with their need in that moment than any particular brand. And why that's important for your business is, is that it means that if you found within that critical moment that you have the ability to win a new customer, even if under nor normal circumstances, they would be buying somewhere else. To demonstrate this, I'd like to share a, well, not so recent, <laughs> it's a year ago at this point, micro moment of my own that does a good job of illustrating this point. After that, we'll move on to take a look at different ways that Google can help searchers to find your business online. So this is my five-year-old daughter, Soleil. When I did this slide, she was five. She's now six. It's a year later. The time is just going. This is my six-year-old daughter, Soleil. And those of you who have school-age children know that Read Across America Week is usually observed during the first week of March, so we just passed it again. And when you have little ones around Soleil's age, schools usually ask parents to come in to volunteer to read to their children. At Soleil School, they came up with fun themes for each day of the week, and Soleil and I decided that I would come in to read on Wacky Wednesday, and the book that we would read, one of her favorite books from home, would be Fox and Socks by Dr. Seuss. On Tuesday afternoon, however, when I picked her up, she informed me that we needed to find another book because someone else's parent had already read the same book that day, earlier that day. I had no time to get another book on the way home, so my only option was to do so before I showed up to read the following day. Thankfully, I had chosen the 2.30 p.m. slot, so that gave me, the, you know, the morning to figure this out. So the following day, after completing some business at my bank, I got, took out my phone, went on Google, and put in the search term, children's bookstore near me. Much to my delight, a bookstore came up that was only three blocks and one avenue away from the bank's location. Now, I had been using this as business bank for at least five years <laughs> and never knew that this bookstore existed. But in my micro moment and going on to Google, I was able to find it. So needless to say, all was well that ended well. And with a combination of rainbow hair, a reading of There's a Bird on Your Head and Mismatched Sneakers, Wacky Wednesday ended up being a resounding success. And all because I was able to find a solution to my micro moment by doing a Google search. So I think a lot of times when we do these presentations, you know, a lot of things can seem theoretical or conceptual, but I like to add personal experiences because I think that they're a little bit more relatable. And it also gets the wheels turning in terms of how you yourself search and find information and also hopefully how you can use the knowledge gained in today's presentation to use some best practices so that your business is easily found as well. Okay, so let's move on and take a look at exactly how search works. The first thing to understand is that when you do a Google search, you're not actually searching the entire web. You're searching Google's index of the web. Think of the web as an ever-growing library filled with billions of books. And think of one of the books as your website. However, there's no card catalog to help you find anything and no central database. On top of that, people aren't simply searching for websites. What they're searching for is specific information inside those sites. So how in the world do people find anything? This is where search engines like Google come into play. Google's job is to read the book, categorize the pages, and help searchers find the information on those pages. Google finds information on the web by sorting through all those billions of sites and web pages and showing people where to find the answers that they're looking for. To do that, Google uses software called a web crawler, and you guys may also have heard, <clears throat> sorry, um, the term spider or robot or bot being used, all the same thing. Google's crawler is known as Googlebot. Googlebot starts with a list of URLs and it then visits these websites looking for new links to add to the index. 
It also looks for changes that have been made to the website as well as any dead links. Googlebot follows links from page to page, sending website information back to Google servers to update the index, which in turn ultimately helps searcher, searchers to find the information they're looking for within specific web pages. Googlebot processes each page it indexes, taking note of important information ranging from keywords to website freshness, and it stores it in the index. Think of the index like the index in the back of a book with an entry for every word seen on every indexed web page. Huge and ever-growing, Google's index contains hundreds of billions of web pages. And every time a person searches Google, the search is looking for information that is stored and organized in the index. If you can imagine it, there are more than a trillion, can you guys believe this, a trillion, oh my God, searches made worldwide each year. It's hard for me to wrap my head around that number. So here's another way to imagine it. Hopefully you heard that, I just clapped my hands. That was one second. And in that one second, Google just processed about 40,000 searches. So when you think about it like that, about 40,000 searches every second, then the trillion number kind of makes sense, right? So 40,000 searches just happened. For each of the corresponding search results pages, how in the world did Google decide which websites and resources to display? These decisions all happen automatically and is the work of a computer algorithm, of course. Google's algorithm considers more than 200 factors or signals when a search is performed. The signals include basic criteria like things such as language and location of the searcher, as well as what type of device is being used. Other signals include the age of the content of the web pages, its relevance to the search query, and whether the page provides a good overall user experience, and of course, a lot more. I said 200 factors, right? That was just about seven or so that I listed. After identifying the best set of results from the information that's stored in the index, Google presents the results to the searcher. And to think that all of this just happened in a fraction of a second. Let's take a look at an example search results page. When someone searches Google, they typically type a phrase or ask a question, like I did, describing what they want to find on the web. This is called a search query. Google's job is to show the most relevant information on the search results page so the searcher finds exactly what they're looking for. As we can all relate to, in today's world, the consumer expects to find exactly what they're looking for without taking too much of their time. The screen we're looking at together is a search results page, and I think that we're all familiar with this screen. The tips in today's workshop are especially relevant to the results you see in the center well of the page. These are organic or what are called natural search results. The information presented about each site in the organic results is called a snippet. Each, each snippet includes a URL, and this is what we're seeing highlighted in blue, a page title, which is in green and usually a page description that gives searchers more information about that result. Some search results show a business profile on the right side of the page, and incidentally, this information can be managed by the business owner with a free tool called Google My Business. The search results may display relevant ads served by a product called Google Ads. The illustration points out where images of products can appear at the top of the page. These are what are known as shopping ads. 
You may also see text ads in the search results. And the reason that you know that they're ads is that they're usually labeled with that little green um, square that says ad. So that's how you know that someone is being paid to be displayed on the top of a search result pages or someone is paying. Google's being paid and someone is paying. I'll point out one last section of the search results page. At the bottom of the search results page, you will see a list of searches related to the query. That's a really cool feature that helps you see what other people are searching for too. It can help you to refine your own search and also give you some insight as to how other people are searching Google for a similar topic or product or service. And many people ignore the bottom, those that bottom listing related searches. I always look because nine times out of 10, if I am not getting exactly what I'm looking for in by, by using my keywords or search terms, and I use some of the related search terms, nine times out of 10, I get a lot closer because th these are the terms that other people are using frequently on Google. If we were meeting in person, this is a mini exercise that we would do together. Of course, we don't, we're unable to do so today, but I highly recommend that when you get a copy of the presentation that you do this for yourself and for your business. What you would do is open a web browser window and visit Google and search for words and phrases that should present your website in the search results. So depending on the kind of business that you have. See if you show up. If you do show up, what does your listing look like? What does it say about your business? How does it look? Where do the click results take you? If you do not show up and your competition shows up, then you should definitely do a review to see how they're presenting themselves and possibly why they're showing up and you're not showing up. So this is a great exercise for you to do um, using your, if you have a personal website or a business website, just to kind of figure out and see how you are um, already showing up on Google. Now that we know how we appear across Google search pages, let's take a look at tips and tools you can use to help to address any potential issues that you may be having. The next section dives deeper into ways you can help your website appear in the various sections using search engine optimization tips and tools. And you guys may be familiar with the term SEO, so search engine optimization, the shortened term is SEO. So let's dive in. Google My Business offers a free business profile on Google. And this profile shows your crit critical business information to searchers across both Google Search and Maps on all devices. Google My Business doesn't replace a business website, but it can help your profile to stand out in search results and on the map and send potential customers to your main site. Your business profile is automatically optimized for different devices. Creating a business profile helps you control the details that Google displays about your business, like business hours, contact information, store locations, photos and videos, and much more. This allows you to ensure that all of your information across Google Search and Maps is accurate and up to date. Here are a few specific, relatively non-technical tips that can help your website appear in organic search results. Regularly publish relevant original content, and this content, content should be useful, information-rich, clear, and accurate. Be sure to include keywords that users would type to find your pages and make sure that your site actually includes those words in the copy. Always lead with your most important information. For example, if your goal is to get people to call your business, keep your phone number prominent. Bulleted lists can help to make text more readable. And while there's no rule of thumb, the more frequently you update your website, the more likely it will be to appear in search engine results. As you publish content, keep it well organized. When your website content is organized into logical, 
clearly labeled areas. It helps human visitors to find your information more easily. And it also helps Google's algorithm to better understand the content of your site. Every web page should include a title and description as part of the code. Many content management systems offer the option to enter this text. And if you have this option, make sure that all of these title elements are descriptive, specific, and accurate. Images can have a very important influence on the overall appearance and success of your website. So here are some basic tips for selecting images. The images you select should be clear and in focus, and they should look right in the overall website design. So many people are using templates to design websites these days. WordPress is usually um, one of the first choices. But you have to be careful because many times, where when it comes to the layout of the images within a template, some templates have options where you can import either a horizontal or vertical um, shot picture, right? So sometimes there's an option, but there are times where you can only use, based on the template, horizontal pictures or vertical pictures. So you have to be really careful that if this is a limitation, that you're using pictures that are actually that are actually going to fit properly into the template. Otherwise, what happens is that you, you've run the risk of your images being cut off or you having to stretch them. And once you start you know, doing things like stretching and shrinking, then the quality of the image decreases. It's almost always better to use real photos rather than stock images. And if you are going to use stock images, a word of caution, don't just go to Google and find some pretty pictures that you like. <laughs> many of those images are copyrighted. There are many sites that offer royalty-free images. The one that I've used in the past is called Pixabay. There are hundreds of them. I just happen to like Pixabay. And that's P-I-X-A-B-A-Y. And you set up a free account and you are free to use any images from that site on your website. You wouldn't have to worry about getting a cease or desist letter <laughs> from some photographer or other business owner who found out that you were using their images that you found in Google. Make sure you add image descriptions, also known as alt text or alt tags. This helps Google understand what the image is. Think of this like back in the day, you know how we used to write um, people's names or the location at the back of an actual photograph? We don't take actual photographs anymore, right? So it's the same concept. Attaching the alt text makes it easier for people who are visually impaired and who use screen readers to quote unquote read the picture, if that makes any sense. Make sure the size is optimized for the web. That can be a little tricky because digital images have two types of sizes. One is called the file size and the second dimension <clears throat> refers to actual dimension. So in terms of file size, a larger file size could mean a higher quality image. But there's a trade-off. It takes longer for a web page to load with a bigger file size. OK? And the second image size refers to dimensions. And for the web, dimensions are measured in pixels. So without getting too technical, you can make an image smaller, right? But but if you make the dimensions bigger, the image will appear blurry or pixelated on a website. So this can be a little confusing, but if you have access to a web developer or a graphic designer, even if you're putting the website together yourself using a template, if you can just ask them simply to optimize your pictures <laughs> for web, for your website, then they would be able to know exactly how to adjust the images so that you don't run into these problems. Image size is especially important because you want to optimize for load time. The probability of bunks on a website, so bounce means when somebody goes to a website, it's taking forever to load and then they leave. So the probability of bounce on a website increases 32% as the page loads from one to three seconds. In other words, you pretty much just have three seconds to hold the attention of somebody that lands on your website. And this is even tougher for mobile devices. 
53% of visits that are abandoned on mobile devices, it's because the site was taking more than three seconds to load. So that's another homework <laughs> assignment. You know, take, take a look at how quickly your website is loading, both on desktop and mobile, but especially pay attention to the mobile load time, because as we know, most people are accessing the web via their mobile devices. So here are some free tools you can use to help your website have a great online presence. Content is important, but make sure your site loads quickly. Why? If you have a really content-rich website, but it's taking too long to load, it's counterproductive to what you're trying to achieve. Because if everyone is leaving, then nobody is able to actually enjoy that great content. Load time, the speed that your pages appear is very important, like I said, especially on mobile devices. And optimizing for load time matters for every sec, because for every second delay in mobile page load, conversions can fall by up to 20%. This is not good. You can check the speed of your website by trying Google's free Test My Site tool. And you access this tool by going to g.co slash test my site. The test scores mobile speed or how long it takes the site to load on a phone. So this is definitely a good test. Keep in mind that it's not just the strength of the web connection that determines mobile speed, but also the elements such as the images on the web pages. After evaluating your site, the test generates a report with a list of specific suggestions that you can use to further optimize your site. Another tool that can help your website appear in organic results is a tool called Google Search Console. Search Console helps you monitor and maintain your website's presence in Google's organic search results on all devices. Here are some things you can do with Search Console. You can make sure that Google can access your site. You can submit new content and remove content that you no longer want shown up in search results, and you can monitor your site for problems. Search Console shows you how Google and the world at large sees your website. For example, you can see reports that tell you which queries cause your site to appear in search results, which websites link to your site, if your site works well on mobile devices, and of course, a lot more. Search Console is free, and you can access it by visiting g.co slash search console. To wrap up our website tips, let's take a look at a third tool that can help you find ideas for creating new content, and that would be Google Analytics. To begin to understand the strengths and weaknesses of your website, you need to understand exactly what your visitors did or didn't do when they got there. This is called Website Analytics Data. Google offers a free analytics tool called Google Analytics. Analytics includes a huge suite of customizable reports that answers questions about the effectiveness of your site, like what are people reading and viewing? How much time do people spend? If it's an e-commerce site, where are people abandoning their shopping carts? And if you advertise with Google, that data integrates into analytics reports so you can measure the effectiveness of your ad campaigns. To sum it up, Google Analytics reports can help you make smart decisions about your site's design, content, and functionality. If you're wondering how you can figure out what the popular search terms for your business are, you can do so by using Google Trends. Google Trends is a free web-based tool that shows the relative popularity of different search terms on Google. The data is presented in a graph on a scale of 0 to 100, with 100 representing the peak search volume. If it has enough data on that particular search term, Trends can show a forecast of search volume, related popular searches, and rising searches. And rising searches would be searches that are experiencing significant growth. You can use it to find and compare the popularity of different words and phrases, determine seasonality of different searches, and see where these searches are originating from geographically. 
All of this information can help you to see what topics people are interested in and create relevant content to publish on your site. And you should, I wouldn't even say you can, <laughs> you should try using Google Trends by visiting g.co slash trends. As with the previous exercise, if we were meeting in person, we would have done this together. But please, I really urge you to do these exercises on your own once you get a copy of the presentation because the instructions will be there. And so the goal of doing this ex exercise is to find out whether the current words that you're using on your site coincide with the popular search terms being used by your potential customers when they are looking for businesses like yours. All right. So what I like about these presentations is that there are always things that you can apply immediately or as soon as possible so that you can actually enjoy the benefits of all of these tools that are available to you for free to improve your online presence. OK, we are right in the middle of the presentation, and I know that that's a lot. So if anyone has any pressing questions about the first half of this presentation, I'll take them now. If not, we can just keep going, and then I'll answer all questions at the end. Anything that anyone is you know, confused about in terms of what I went over in the first half of the presentation. And Simone, if you can just read any questions to me, that would be great. Patia, yeah. I, don't, I don't show any uh, questions at this time. Perfect. All right. So we'll just keep going. OK, so let's explore yet another way to reach customers online. And that would be by advertising your products and services with Google. So what I recommend is that you guys get really good at the organic stuff before you think about spending money. Because the way I like to think about it is that you should, you know, explore all of the free tips and tactics, especially as a small business owner. And we're all going through um, trying times. Enjoy the results of those tips and tactics before you decide to invest in doing advertising. Right. So get really good at all of the things that I've shared before. And then eventually you will maximize those efforts and then it would be time to move on. I want to introduce you to Honest Soul Yoga, a small business that was able to grow significantly by using ads strategically. As an intro, we'll watch a quick video about them, and then we'll use them as an example as I walk you through the steps of setting up a smart campaign using Google Ads. All right, so this is the second video in the presentation. Let me get it up and running. I deployed to Afghanistan in 2007. Being there was the hardest part of my life. My stress level was through the roof. Yoga made me realize that I could be able to handle those stressful moments, that anxiety, and I wanted to share that with the military community. So when I decided to open a yoga studio, it was really important to get as many people as possible through our door, not only to help them, but also because we had to pay our bills. My goal was to get people to call us because we knew if we could talk to them, it would be easier for them to show up and come through our front door. It's actually pretty magical because since we've launched our Google Ads, our phone started ringing off the hook. I know my ads are working when more people than normal are walking through the door, when the number of intro offers that we're selling have doubled, and in result, we had to add 10 new classes a week, we had to hire more staff. What I love about Google Ads, it's that when I'm super busy at work, I can just check my phone and I can instantly track my results. As a small business owner, it's bigger than just you. It's about the families you impact, your employees, your own community. I have somewhere I can let my guard down and everybody else is here for a common reason. Everybody that I've met here and they were looking for something in their life to help them, either physically, emotionally, spiritually, our work makes such an impact on so many lives. We're so lucky that we get to do this. I like to say that I started a community center for adults, and we just happened to do yoga here. All right, let me get the presentation back up. Here we go. All right, so again, real world examples of how small businesses just like you are actually effectively using um, Google tools to get in front of their audiences strategically. All right, so let's move on. 
Before we dive into how to set up a smart campaign, let's review where ads can appear. Ads created with smart campaigns can appear on both the Google search and display networks. The Google search network is a group of search related websites and apps. And your ad can appear when people search for products or services you promote. The network includes, of course, Google.com, Google Maps, Google Play, plus search-related sites that partner with Google to publish ads. So this is just not only Google um, property we're talking about. They're also partner sites. The Google Display Network is a large group of websites and apps that show Google ads. These ads can reach people earlier in the buying cycle and they usually appear alongside content related to your specific business. Ads appear when consumers are looking at content such as probably browsing websites, watching YouTube videos, checking email in Gmail, or using their mobile apps. Ads on the display network can also show images. Your ads may include images from your Google My Business listing. Right, So that is definitely a reason to make sure that you have a Google My Business listing. With smart campaigns, your ads can appear on both the search and display networks. Depending on the goals you set, the Google ad system will automatically determine where to show your ads to give you the best chance for success. If you're not yet familiar with Smart Campaigns, it's a campaign that was designed specifically for small businesses. They're flexible, which allows you to choose your goal and customize your content. Your ads can bring visitors to your website and connect to offline customers by driving phone calls and store visits. There's no contract, no minimum commitment, startup fee or cancellation fee and you are ultimately in control of when and where the ads show as well as your budget and with a straightforward setup process smart campaigns can get your business advertising in, in line in as little as a couple minutes once your ad is set up google smart technology will help find ways to improve your ads and help you to get better results so to start, here's how you do it. You would, of course, sign into your Google Ads account. If you don't have an Ads account, you can create one by visiting ads.google.com and clicking Start Now. Once you've set up and signed into your Google Ads account, you will be prompted to the first step of creating an ad using Smart Campaigns, which will be to enter your business name and your business web address. Next, you have three goal options. The first goal is to call your business. Choose this goal if you get customers primarily over the phone, you want to talk to customers before setting up appointments, or you want to track calls using a specific number. This goal might be a good choice for appointment-focused businesses like beauty salons, home repair, and pet sitting services. Next, there's the visit your physical location goal, and you would choose this goal if you have a physical location that customers can visit without contacting you first. This goal might be a good choice if you're promoting a retail store, a showroom, or any kind of business where having in-person traffic is important. This goal also helps connect online marketing with actual offline action. Then there's a third goal, which is to take action on your website. You would choose this goal if most of your business is conducted online. You want customers to complete a trackable action on your website. And this goal is a good choice if customers can buy your products online or complete an important action like signing up for an appointment, a class, or registering for a newsletter. So going back to Honest Soul Yoga, we're going to use them to build a campaign. Honest Soul Yoga wants to drive more foot traffic to their boutique. So in this case, they would select goal number two, which is to visit your physical location. 
It's important to remember that you can only select one goal per ad. However, if you have more than one goal, you can create multiple ads for each goal. All right, so just one goal per ad. Now, Honest Soul Yoga can proceed to the next step in setting up their smart campaign. The owner needs to specify where she wants her ads to appear geographically. When you create an ad, you will see a couple of options for choosing where your ad can appear. The first option, you can specify a radius around your business's location. In the second option, you can identify cities, regions, or countries that, that you would like to attract customers from, right? So for the example in this slide, we're seeing that there is our specific, I would say, um, neighborhoods, I would say, Alexandria, Springfield, Bellhaven, that can be selected. As you adjust your geographic range, look at the top corner to see the estimated audience size. It tells you how many people search Google within that selected area, okay? Which option you choose depends on your business. If you're advertising for local clientele, then you might just choose a radius. If you're advertising for a business that sells products beyond the local area, you may decide to choose a larger audience by expanding it to different neighborhoods. Choose the audience that makes the most sense for your individual business goal. If Honest Souls Yoga goal is to drive a shop and rush to their boutique, they might want to target ads within a radius closer to the shop, right? They can experiment with the distance, starting with knowing exactly where their existing customers come from. And to do so, they might look at their current database and determine that most clients live within a 35-mile radius of the studio. That information can help them to set an effective ad radius. The owner can always go in and change it. And in fact, she probably will want to expand the ad's geographic reach when the new yoga studio opens in a different location. The next step is choosing a business category and the products and services that you want to advertise. This helps the system understand the customers that you want to reach. For those of you who are familiar already with online advertising, here's a notable difference with smart campaigns. You will not create a list of keywords. Instead, the system will automatically generate search phrases that help determine when your ad should appear. Honest Soul Yoga wants to promote the yoga mat package and try to get people in to try a class. So they will look for the most appropriate options. The system may offer some suggestions. Be sure to only select the items that make sense for your particular promotion. Honest Soul's Yoga Smart Campaign is coming right along. The owner has chosen a goal, a geographic area, and described what she's advertising. Now it's time to create an ad. A text ad on Google typically contains three headlines, two description lines, and a display URL. And the display URL would be the web page that appears in the ad. It is very important to focus on showcasing the most relevant, compelling information on your ad. With smart campaigns, you have the ability to set and fine tune a budget for each campaign. You will set a monthly budget that makes sense for your business. The cost will vary per click, but you will never pay more than the budget that you set. This is a question that many people have. So for example, you only pay for the actual clicks and calls that your ads receives within the budget that you set. So if your maximum monthly budget is $300, but you only receive $200 worth of clicks, you'll only be charged $200, which is great, because then maybe you can add that $200, that $100, sorry, surplus, to next month's $300, and now potentially double the results of your ad campaign, because in the following months, you would have an ad budget of $400. Google will recommend options, but you can always feel free to enter your own budget.
If you choose to enter your budget, you'll see an overlay. Drag the slider to select your budget, and below the slider, you will see a typical competitor budget range. As you adjust your budget, you will see the estimated ad performance on the right side of the page. This estimates how many ad views and clicks your ad might receive per month based on the selected budget. Remember that you can review your ad spend and make adjustments at any time in your account. There are a few more optional features you can add to your smart campaign. One is to add images and logos to it, which I highly recommend. As we all know, images get a much better response than text only. Adding images to your ad can help to grab the attention of potential customers, and you're allowed to add up to three images and logos. Once you've uploaded your images, you can view how your ad will look in different formats. This is a really cool feature of smart campaigns. After you upload your images, Google Smart Technology will create a series of responsive ads for your campaign to test, and this in turn gives you much better search results, or ad campaign results, I should say. The last campaign we'll cover today is video campaigns. This campaign type lets you show video ads on their own or within other streaming video content on YouTube and across the Google Display Network. Showing video ads may seem pretty sophisticated, but the setup is really straightforward. And the best part is that you can use videos from your own YouTube account. And like other campaign types, you can see ad performance and tweak your targeting. Video ads help to accomplish goals related to sales, generating leads, increasing web traffic, building brand awareness, and increasing brand consideration. There are five available video ad formats, and you don't have to worry about memorizing them because if you were to set up video ads, they, you know, there will be an explanation um, as the kind of ad that you can run, and then you can choose. So this is just for information. In-stream ads run before, during, or after all the videos on YouTube, the display network, or apps. Ads may also run on YouTube videos embedded on other sites. And after five seconds, they can be skipped. So we're all familiar with those. Video discovery ads appear on YouTube only, and they're seen in places where people discover content. So remember, video discovery ads, YouTube only. Outstream ads show on partner sites, and these ads are available on mobile devices and tablets. Non-skippable in-stream ads are 15 seconds or less, and as the label suggests, we can't skip them. And lastly, bumper ads are designed to increase brand awareness. Bumper ads are just six seconds or less, and they cannot be skipped. And again, no need to memorize those definitions because if you were to go here, um, you would be reminded um, on the definitions and asked to choose which kind of video ad you wanna run. So, to wrap up today's session, we showed you different ways to reach customers online, showcasing how to bring visibility to your products and services in different areas of Google search results pages. Here's a really quick recap. We went over how to improve your website, and hopefully you got that it's really important that your website loads quickly between one and three seconds, especially if it's being viewed on mobile devices. We went over how to create or claim your free business profile at Google Business by going to google.com slash business. And also we went over a variety of tools that you can use to optimize your website. And lastly, I did a quick review of Google Ads and how you can fine tune your offerings when people are searching for your products or services. When you get a copy of this presentation, you will have this slide, of course, where you can actually go specifically to the mini websites that cover each of the topics we went over in depth. In depth, not depth, in depth. Okay. 
If you want to learn more about any of the topics covered in today's workshop and do a really deep dive, I highly recommend that you go to these little microsites. Another great resource is our quick help videos. Get answers and learn how to make the most of Google's tools in just a few minutes. So for example, if you want a little bit more direction on how to set up your Google My Business profile, you can access the quick help video that shows you exactly how to do that. In addition to other things like how to create a YouTube channel for your business and how to start a Google Meet conference. So that's about it for today. We had a great time together. To recap, Grow With Google is a new initiative to help people prepare for work, find jobs, and grow their businesses. Job seekers can grow their skills in order to find new jobs. Teachers can learn how to put the latest technology to work both inside and outside of the classroom. And small business owners can build their online presence and find new customers. There's also great information here for startups who can learn how to get their ideas, the exposure they need, and developers can access information to sharpen their current skills and master new ones. And of course, to learn more about the program, please visit google.com slash grow. So that is the official end of today's presentation. But before we leave, if anyone has any questions on the second half of the presentation, I'd be happy to take them now. We do have a couple, Patia. OK. <clears throat> so Juliana Brooks says that she's an online retailer based in Atlanta. She's tried to set up Google My Business, and now her business profile has been suspended. Right. <clears throat> How can she get my business, get her business listed? Her address is not just a virtual address, but a place where customers can visit, and it is staffed during regular business hours. Hmm. Okay, so I would be interested as to the reason why the the account has been suspended maybe it's not obvious that you have a brick and mortar location because i will say that the google my business um feature is intended for people who have either have brick and mortar locations like stores or even for people for people who are consultants who service they may not people may, clients may not come to their homes but they meet their clients at their businesses within specific service areas so maybe it isn't clear that this just isn't an online store because if it were only an online store then that's not what the product is intended for. Um, what I would I would like to to to, to help you with this um, to help you get rectified. I'm going to put my email address in the chat. If you can just forward me whatever notifications or things that Google has sent back to you, then I can help you to. Um, I can help you to point you in the right direction um, to get your situation solved because I'm guessing that maybe it seems as though you're just um, an online um, retailer and maybe that's why they suspended it. I'm not sure, but it's sounding like it. Okay, okay. so in the chat, I don't have, all right, I'm going to put my email, Jennifer, for some reason, I mean, Simone, for some reason, I can't, um, I can't email everyone, so I'm going to send you my email address. And if you can just share it with her, that would be great. Send we, it. We to can, my, we can send it to, do that. Right. Send it to this one um, because that's the one I use for all my Google stuff. Patia at gmail dot com. If you can hear me, it's Patia P E T I A dot A B D U R at gmail.com. If you can just forward whatever notifications or whatever you have from Google, I can see if I can help you to fast track getting that being reinstated. You said patia.abdur at gmail.com. At gmail.com. Yes. Yes. Use that okay. one for, for I gmail. just posted it into the chat. Perfect. Yeah. That's the best one for situations <laughs> like this, not my other business one. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. And then the next question we've got is um, people want to know how they can find out how customers are reaching their website and what are things that they can do to uh, get them to come back, maximizing their return. Right, so that is definitely a Google Analytics um, sort of answer. So if you don't have Google Analytics 
set up on your website, you definitely need to do so. And any web developer, you can also do it yourself if you're tech savvy. Um, I prefer not to mess with codes and things. <laughs> so I usually ask somebody who is a web developer to do it, but it is a free service. And once once the, the code is installed on your web pages, it gives you a very clear idea of where the site on your where the traffic on your site is coming from, which pages people are spending the most time on, and also where they're abandoning abandoning. And it also shows you the customer journey. So maybe somebody will go to the home page and then they'll click around and they'll go to another page and then they'll click around and go to somewhere else. And so you really need to get a great idea of the pages or the content on your website that are stimulating interest and in having people stay on the website and the content that may not be working. So if you know you see that 90% of the people that visit a specific page leave the website, um, then that page may be a problem. There's something on that page that is not properly engaging um, your audience. So the first step would be to have Google Analytics installed on the website because that will give you all of the data that you need so that you're able to then move forward and make any adjustments or changes that need to be made. Okay, and then the final question that uh, we've got today is, you had mentioned um, about, the, about uh, keywords and how to gauge their success and could you just uh, remind us of that? Um, yes. So that would that be that would be Google Trends. And when you get a copy of the presentation, just make a note to yourself to go back to that slide. Um, that would be Google Trends. And what you would do is that you would, if if you don't have an idea but you have some educated guesses, um, you would put those keywords and search terms in Google Trends, and Google Trends will tell you exactly. Um, how those keywords and search terms are um, performing across Google search. So, you know, are they very popular? Are they, you know, are they trending right now? Um, are they somehow experiencing increased volume of searches? Um, that sort of information. And based on the, of course, you would use key terms and, and words that are appropriate for your business, right? Your category of business. And so with that information, you're then able to make sure that the copy on your website, your meta tag descriptions, um, all include the keywords that have a high level of popularity. Okay, and I do apologize. There is one additional no question. So um, we've got a customer who says that whenever she Googles her business name, there is an unauthorized company posted posted their contact information on their site. On uh, their actual contact. websites? Oh my God. So wow. how do I get someone with Google it says, how do I get go about getting that removed when someone Googles my business name? Okay, so unfortunately, if it was a Google My Business profile that I had someone in my last, this, when I did this presentation, it was a Google My Business profile that somebody had claimed that didn't actually own a business. That is easier to rectify. However, if it's, this is somebody's, website that they own, right? Google really doesn't have the authority to make them change it. They would have the, there's a process for reclaiming your own Google My Business listing because that's a Google product. However, if this is somebody's website that they own, Google does not have the authority to change that. Um, this is sounding like it needs to be a legal matter. <laughs> you may mm -hmm. need to get a business attorney involved because if they're misrepresenting your business on their actual website, then that's something completely different. Okay. That is the last question that we have. Okay, great. Well, you guys were a great audience. I hope that all the information was useful. Um, and like I said, if you have any questions once you receive the copy of the presentation, um, don't be shy. Just shoot me a quick email and I will try to assist you. All right, everyone. So this has been great. If you guys wanted to close off with any closing announcements, that would be fine. And until okay. next time. All right. Thank you so much, Patia. You did a, a really great job. And I learned a lot uh, personally <laughs> uh, from your presentation. So I really appreciate that. Okay. Uh, if there are any questions, of course, make sure that you email Patia 
or you may reach out to us at the Better Business Bureau. And uh, finally, I just want to remind you that if you know graduating high school seniors for the spring 2021, please direct them to the Big Better Business Bureau Center for Character Ethics um, so that you may uh, pass along that information. Last year, we presented $23,000 in scholarship money. It goes directly to the student for them to use in their post-secondary education needs, however, um, that may, whatever that may be. So it doesn't go directly to the school, it goes directly to that student. So we just please incur, ask you to, um, you know, to share that with other people. And thank you for your time and attention today. And we um, hope you have a great evening and please continue to stay safe. Absolutely. Have a great one.